welcome to lawcaseuk.com where today I'm going to be analysing the Supreme Court decision in the so-called prorogation cases. Now there are two of these cases, the first is Miller and the Prime Minister and that is an appeal emanating from the High Court in London and the second is an appeal from the Court of Sessions in Scotland and that is the case of Cherry and the Advocate General. Now the background to both of these cases is of course Brexit, the UK's potential withdrawal from the European Union. And because of this background, the judgment of the Supreme Court could have significant political and constitutional effect. And perhaps with that in mind, the court decided to sit with the maximum number of justices that it could, that is 11 out of the available 12. And you might recall that it did something similar in the first Brexit case, that of Miller and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. Now in that first case, the court found against the government and there was an 8-3 to three split. In the current case, the prorogation cases, the court once again found against the government, but this time the court was unanimous in that all 11 justices found against the government. And consequently, there is a single judgment um, in the case. And, of course, it's already Supreme Court authority, but given the strength of feeling and the number of justices coming down against the government, the decision that it's reached has considerable weight, even for a Supreme Court authority. Now, what I want to do today is look at the facts that give rise to the cases and also look at, at least briefly, the legal reasoning of the court in arriving at its, its judgment. Now, in terms of the facts, the subject matter of the cases is that of prorogation. And prorogation is a mechanism by which Parliament is, in effect, put into abeyance in between sessions of Parliament. So prorogation brings to an end a session of Parliament, and at that point, Parliament is in a period of abeyance until the next setting of Parliament um, begins. And importantly, during this period, Parliament can't act as Parliament. It can't meet, it can't debate, it can't vote on legislation, for example. So it is, in effect, functionally frustrated. And that's quite important for the decision that the Supreme Court reaches. The other thing one should say about the prorogation here is that, in many ways, prorogation is a mundane thing that happens relatively regularly. However, what was unusual about this case was the length of prorogation. In evidence, the court heard that prorogation would normally be something like four to six days. Here we have the, the Parliament prorogued for five weeks out of a potential eight weeks in a particular period. And that particular period is in the lead up to what might become Brexit Day on the 31st of October. And that's quite important that not only is it a long time, but it is a crucial time, and the court itself described these as quite exceptional circumstances. So at the time the prorogation takes place, it is at a time of quite exceptional circumstances. Now, even though Parliament is the institution that's affected, the decision to prorogue is not one for Parliament, but one for the monarch. And as you might expect in the 21st century, the monarch doesn't make that decision off her own bat. She does that on advice from her prime minister. Um, and because the prerogative power that she's exercising is a personal one, because it is a rubber stamping, the target of the litigants in the two cases is not her decision to prorogue, but the prime minister's advice or his decision to advise the monarch to prorogue. Parliament. So that's what's being targeted there. The question is the lawfulness of that advice to the monarch. So with that in mind, the Supreme Court identifies four questions that it thinks it needs to ask in deciding the case. And let me read those to you and then I'll take them in turn as we go through the judgment. The first question is whether this is a justiciable matter at all, and that is whether the court is capable of assessing the lawfulness of the Prime Minister's advice. And the High Court had decided that this was not a justiciable issue, and they decided that they weren't competent to decide the lawfulness of what the Prime, uh, what the Prime Minister had done or said. 
But this question was then to be revisited by the Supreme Court, and of course they disagreed with the High Court on this. Having decided or explored the question whether they could actually consider the lawfulness of the action, the next question, and one that bothered the High Court, it has to be said, was what was the standard to be applied? Because in some respects the High Court said, well, we have no standard against which to measure the conduct of a Prime Minister in these circumstances. So the next question that the Supreme Court had to look at potentially was, well, what standard should we apply, what measures should we apply in deciding um, the lawfulness or otherwise of the Prime Minister's actions? If it arrived at a standard, it then had to apply it to the facts and decide whether the Prime Minister had behaved lawfully or not according to that standard. And thereafter, if they decided that he had not, the question then became what remedy or remedies should the court grant in the case? So let's have a look at the first issue to begin with, and that's the question whether the court could review the Prime Minister's advice at all, whether it was justiciable in a court of law. Now, the argument against this was that it's a political matter. Some political matters are traditionally outside the reach of the court. They're matters that are dealt with by politics itself, and the Prime Minister is accountable, of course, to Parliament, as well as potentially the court. And they said in this case, this was one of those um, situations where political accountability was the, the right recourse and not legal accountability. It was, in effect, a separation of powers argument. And the High Court had accepted that type of argument. But the Supreme Court did not. They looked at the um, prerogative powers that were involved in here and they said, yes, there are some prerogative powers that if they're being exercised within limits are outside the reach of judicial review. However, there are two things that the court can always do. And that is identify whether a power exists and secondly, identify the limits or the extent of that particular power. And that's what it was going to do in this case. And therefore, the issue was justiciable. It was a matter for the courts. It was a question of law, in effect. So deciding that they could review the Prime Minister's advice, the next question became, well, what test or what measures should they apply in order to decide whether it was lawful or not? And... Here, they decided to compare the behaviour against the effect that it had on two significant constitutional principles and decide whether there was any justification for that effect. Now, the two principles that it looked at, the first is an obvious one, that of parliamentary sovereignty, and it reflected on the fact that prorogation prevents Parliament from exercising its legislative authority, which is really the crux of parliamentary sovereignty, Parliament makes the laws and it's supreme in making those laws. Um, the court said of course that an unlimited power to prorogue would be incompatible with parliamentary sovereignty um, and consequently the power to prorogue can't be unlimited and therefore the court has to look at the where the limits of the power are and one of the things it's going to do is look at the effect on the ability of court to exercise of parliament to exercise its sovereignty. And then the next constitutional principle that it went to look at was that of political accountability. And here they're looking again at the role of Parliament, and that is the role of Parliament in scrutinising and supervising the Prime Minister and Ministers. Now, once again, for the time that Parliament is prorogued, it can't exercise that function. And so the question that the court had to ask itself is looking at the period for which Parliament has been prorogued, are these functions that I've just identified, that the court have identified, are they affected unduly? So the standard or the test that the court came up with to measure lawfulness was this. A decision to prorogue Parliament or to advise the monarch to prorogue Parliament will be unlawful if the prorogation has the effect of frustrating or preventing, without reasonable justification, a key phrase, preventing the ability of Parliament to carry out its constitutional functions as a legislature and the body responsible for the supervision of the executive. So, does it frustrate or present, prevent Parliament from carrying out these functions? And if so, is there a reasonable justification? And of course it goes without saying, the longer the prorogation, the more justification that a Prime Minister would need.
So this left the court assessing as a matter of evidence and in terms of addressing question three, whether by that standard identified the Prime Minister's behaviour is lawful. This left the court asking themselves the question, well, was there a reasonable justification for a prorogation of this length of time in these circumstances? And the court did say that it was sensitive to the responsibilities and to the experience of the Prime Minister. Um, but in an evidential sense, there was a problem here for the government in that whilst the court had before it some evidence as to why there should be a prorogation, i.e. ending one period of Parliament and giving the government time to create a Queen's speech to begin a second um, period of Parliament, it had no real evidence to justify a prorogation of five out of eight weeks. So there was evidence to justify prorogation, but not evidence to justify such a long prorogation in exceptional circumstances. And consequently, they said there was not, there was no reason, let alone a good reason, for that length of prorogation. And therefore, they decided, applying this test, that the, the effect of frustrating Parliament in this way without a reasonable justification was therefore unlawful. And therefore, they answered the third question in that way. And that just left the question of remedy, which often is a relatively simple part of the proceedings. But here it was made slightly more complicated by a particular factor. Um, the first thing, though, was relatively simple, and that was a declaration that the advice was unlawful, and the court um, considered that quite quickly. Um, they wasted no time in granting this. But the question then was, well, what about the purported prorogation? And in effect, the prorogation comes about because the Queen's decision is converted to an order of council, which then become, gets read in the House of Lords to both Houses of Parliament and, and triggers the potential prorogation. Um, and the government said that the court couldn't interfere with that because that was a proceeding in Parliament. And it, both sides accept that proceedings in Parliament can't be um, questioned or impugned in the courts because of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights. The question was a factual one, whether this was a procedure in Parliament. And the court decided that it was not. They decided that prorogation is something that happens outside Parliament even though it is read in Parliament, has the effect in Parliament, it happens outside of Parliament and is not in that sense a proceeding within it. It is imposed on Parliament rather than being part of what Parliament does. And consequently, not only was the Prime Minister's advice declared unlawful, but the order in council that gave rise to the purported, purported prorogation was quashed. And this meant that as the basis for the prorogation was unlawful, it was void, it had no effect, and Parliament therefore had never been prorogued. And indeed, Parliament began sitting the day after the judgment was handed down. Now, that in effect is their decision. It's a quick summary of the case. The judgment's relatively short. It runs only to 24 pages. And some of the usual cases are referred to throughout the judgment. Um, they give technical support to the decision that is reached, but the case rests as much on these big constitutional principles that I've identified as it done, does on any technical legal discussion of particular cases, for example. Um, I could say that like the first Miller, the 17th century case of proclamations, um, a case which I've also analysed on this website, that does get a starring role and is mentioned by Lady Hale in the summary of the judgment that she read at the time the judgment was handed down. That gets a headline mentioned, and in this case the headline is that the, the king, who of course then was the executive in the 17th century, has no prerogative, no power, apart from that which the law of the land allows him and in the current case, of course, the Prime Minister had no power apart from that which the law of the land allowed him. And in this case, it gave him no power to prorogue for this length of time in these circumstances without reasonable justification. So there you have it. On the one hand, it is a case that some people have claimed, particularly in the media, as further evidence of an expedi um, expeditionary, adventurous judiciary 
spreading its tentacles into the political arena. Or, on the other hand, you could say, case of proclamations, 1610, 1611, the court exercised supervisory jurisdiction over the executive then, and they do the same thing in the 21st century in the case of Miller and in the case of Cherry, and therefore nothing's changed.